That's the opening track on the Phenomena album. That's a track called Kiss of Fire. Pleased to say that in the studio with me tonight is my very special guest, the guy that actually wrote the whole thing, Tom Galley. Welcome to Signal Radio, Tom. Good evening. How are you? Not too bad. Nice journey down to Stoke on Trent. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's up actually, not down. <laughs> oh, sorry, yes, can it? Yeah, of course, it's not all that far away, is it? No. Congratulations, first of all, on the album. I must admit, I mean, it's never been off my turntable since I actually got the copy last week. What made you decide to do a concept album like that? Basically, it started off, it seems a long time ago, two years ago, when Mal, myself and Richard Bailey were actually working on a new trapeze album. And we were running the same... We were doing them at the same time. Yeah. Uh, we started... We laid three tracks, originally the original Phenomena tracks, down, which I think one was Dance with the Devil, one was Hell on Wings, at the same time, and it, it it was about that time that David Coverdale came on the scene yeah. and offered Mel the position with Whitesnake. So it's got going back really quite a few years really then when it yeah, first started. Yeah, it, it goes back two years, and at that point in time it was obvious that it was going to take time to do. Uh, because, as I say, Mel disappeared, went on tour with Whitesnake, so it really left Richard and myself. And at that time, I, I looked and I thought, well, to finish the album with the people I wanted, it was going to take, as I said, a fairly long time. So what I did at that point was I stopped recording and I sort of had a rethink because what I was doing was just a normal album yeah. at that time and I thought well by the time this actually comes out it ought to be a little bit more than just an album I I, I then thought along the lines of an audio visual presentation mm. uh, with like a long form video and it, it it grew from that. It started off as we did, as I say, the three tracks originally two years ago. As long as that. Hmm. You've got various musicians on the album, as you say, like your brother Mel, for instance, and also Don Airy and uh, people like Cozy Powell. How did you actually go about picking the musicians for the album? Um, well, Cozy came about really because when Mel went with White Snake, he... There were two lots of tapes that were floating around. That was the Phenomena tapes and the Trapeze tapes, which two White Snake songs came off the Trapeze <laughs> album. Um, and Cozy, when he heard the Phenomena tracks, he said when we came to actually record them, he'd love to do the drums. Well, as you can imagine, they were here, there and everywhere. Yeah. And it was a case of grabbing Cozy when you could grab him. Well, he was away for they were touring for twelve months. And at one time we'd we'd actually lined in pace up just before he joined, went back with Purple. Yeah. To do the drums. And then Cozy came off tour and had a fortnight off and we did the drums uh at Britannia Road during that fortnight. So it, it it was grabbing people while they were physically there. Yeah. The whole album actually tells a story, doesn't it, with it being a concept. What's the story all about? What's the story? <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes wonder whether I know now. <laughs> no. Um, the story really came about... The subject matter was different phenomena. Uh, that's how it originally started. Uh, and when I looked at it in an audio-visual point of view, it had to have, to make the story links, uh, it had to have a storyline that linked every track together. Yeah. So at that time, about two years ago, the, there were a, a spate of people in accidents and went into comas, and they had... Um, sounds or their favourite pop idol played to them while they were in the coma 
and it it was a form of contact through sound while these people were in comas that brought them back to reality yeah and all it was being a sci-fi freak i just took it a stage further in the story uh the girl is goes into a coma and he's trapped within a machine and it it really is a story of her father who's telepathic as well linking into the machine the same way as people playing tapes but he does it telepathically but and f trying to bring her out of the coma but she's she's sort of trapped in the machine as well yeah. which is a a separate world and all it is it's an adventure story with the two of them facing each different phenomena which is each different track and each track has got its own story so in the long form video uh, each track as a visual lasts for about six to eight minutes because you've also got uh, various things to accompany them, like you say, in the video. And also there's a lot of uh, artwork to go with it as well, isn't there? There's like a painting for each track. Yeah. Um, well, I, I felt if we were doing, if it was going to be audio-visual, um, to make the audio part work, it would have been nice for people to have visuals to look at while they're listening. Yeah. It, it it's like a jigsaw. At least it's it's a stage on from just a playing or listening to a record. If they can sort of see visuals, they can then maybe get their own ideas from looking at the visuals. All it is, it's triggering off the imagination by looking at the vi the actual visuals yeah. in, in the book and that was the reason why at the time of doing it um, I roughed the original ones up and a f good friend of mine, an artist called Ian Lowe did all the paintings which are like 3x2 paintings and they've been reduced down but uh, as I say it was like this next piece of the jigsaw so as I say, I didn't want to just do an album and leave it at that. I wanted to sort of at least give uh, a little bit more value and, a li you know, sort of get people thinking while the yeah. album was on. I mean, it's, it's entertainment at the end of the day. Exactly, yeah. Let's play another track anyway from The Phenomena. This one's out as a single at the moment, and there's also a rather gruesome picture to go with this one, isn't there? Dance with the Devil. Dance with the Devil. It's like, like a fellow player, how can I explain it? Playing a fiddle, but looking rather gruesome. We'll play the single anyway, and we'll come back to you in a minute, Tom. And uh, this is the single, as I say, it's out in your shops at the moment. It's called Dance With The Devil, and it's a little bit good, believe me. It goes like this. That's the latest single to be lifted from the Phenomenal album. In fact, the first single, and that's called Dance with the Devil. If you just joined us, my special guest tonight is uh, Tom Galley, who actually wrote the whole project. Now, we were just talking, actually, Tom, when that was actually playing. He had a lot of trouble recording the album, didn't he, with people uh, complaining and things about the noise in the studio. Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, basically, the, w the one night we were at Britannia Row recording t Cozy's drums, I think it was Kiss of Fire, and it was around 12 o'clock at night and if I can explain the drums were recorded in the snooker room which is <laughs> yeah. really ambient in there and cozy set, set up and of course when you're actually recording with the headphones on you don't realize how loud it is in the room and it was pretty horrendous well around 12 o'clock at night the the doorbell ra rang and the lights flashed and we went and the boys in blue <laughs> oh, no. appeared and the, there were a block of flats about a hundred yards away and they were getting calls from the people in these <laughs> flats <laughs> as they could hear Cozy's drums like in the flats so they put a stop to it <laughs> I can imagine. Going back to the single, Dance with the Devil, as I was saying before about the uh, the artwork that actually accompanies that single, is that supposed to be the devil, and is it, that's actually playing the fiddle, or 
Is it something you've sort of worked on yourself? Um, it it it's representative of. I wouldn't say it was the devil. Uh, it, it's it's just a figure, yeah. as such, um, that like people can sort of sort of make up the mind. Yeah. Uh, I I think the problem is. Uh, when when you're dealing with sort of subjects, matters uh, that are mysteries and the unknown and can't be explained, it's like how you see it yourself. Yeah, right? it's how it, you imagine it, things yeah, to be. That's it. I mean, it's it's up to the individual what he sees, and he, I mean, it tends to be that um, I did an interview for an American magazine and you only have to mention things like devil. And the f- next question is, are you into Satanism? Yeah. You know, because they take it really... They do, don't they, over there? Yeah, they take it so seriously. They don't take they? it very seriously. I mean, the album as such is pure entertainment. The subject matter is was picked because it's one of the few things that transcends... Uh, cultures and even language barriers all over the world everyone every country has got its own stories uh, of sort of mystery and sort of I suppose which sort of witchcraft and that type of thing yeah so it does relate into a lot of languages but uh, no, there's no. It was never meant to be controversial. It, obviously, certain people will take it out of context. Yeah. But um, you know, I just hope as people sort of look at the different subjects and sort of get enjoyment out of just listening. As you were saying before about the science fiction side of things, would you say that uh, sort of science fiction films influence you to actually write the the actual material for the album? Um, you know, films like E.T. and, uh, I don't know. Not, uh, e- not, <laughs> not E.T. as such. I mean, e- E.T. is m- more of an 80s yeah. phenomenon as such. Uh, I, I think the the things that always sort of get the imagination going or stick in your mind are things that you actually saw when you were a, a child yourself. Yeah. You know, I, I tend to be able to remember things uh, from when I was sort of seven and nine, because at that point I was an avid cinema goer. And uh, you sort of remember movies like that. So it's sort of the things that are coming on BBC Two now, that like things like this island earth and things like that which were sort of really sort of early yeah. science fiction films uh, in the 60s and sort of 70s there were a spate of films those were probably more the things that had more to do with it did you ever intend it to be sort of along the same lines as say for example the War of the Worlds album anything like that because that actually tells a story but in a different way doesn't it yeah uh, uh, War of the Worlds Really, I, I, I mean, it came off an established book. Um, and I think with War of the Worlds, it uh, it played a little bit safe. I, 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 you know, I thought it was a great record. It obviously was a great record. It sold enough yeah. copies <laughs> worldwide. Uh, but I, I didn't... And it, it tended to be... Uh, like Alan Parsons works as well it, they do great albums they tend to be very technical Alan Parsons works now I think he's gone so technical I don't. I, th- I tend to think the music suffers yeah. but I wanted the the subject matter to have a lot more drive and than, shall we say, War of the World, yeah. you know. Um, I, d- I didn't want it to be as sterile as that. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to get a, a little bit sort of, of excitement back yeah. into the music. 
What about the logo on the uh, the front cover of the album? Um, where does that originate from? Because as kind of a um, how can I explain it? It's sort of like a, a splodge with a circle around it, and a little girl cupping her hands in the background. Is that got a particular meaning or? <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't know how yeah, to explain it. I think yes. that's great. That, that, that probably explains it well. Um, how that started off, uh, you would never guess from looking at it, was originally it looked like uh, a cactus, mm. which I was told by the powers that be in some real depth that it was the Greek symbol for... for uh, mystery and different f f uh, phenomena. Yeah. But I had originally, when we were designing the cover, I had 25 different versions of this cactus from square to, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm splodges. A, yes. <laughs> to splodge. No, the splodge didn't actually occur. Where the splodge came from was there was no way really the cactus was ever going to work. So we sat down and I said, have you seen, I shouldn't say this because Disney will probably want some money from you. <laughs> I said, uh, have you seen the Disney start on the uh, Disney time? If you see yeah. the star that crops up, I said, well, we could do with something similar to that. It's like a trail behind it, isn't it? It's hard to try and explain, actually, on the radio. I wish this was television. We can actually see it. But looking at the cover as well, with the little girl, as I say, with the hands cupped, mm. it looks very similar, you know, to, a, like, a, a film poster, really, doesn't it? Like a science fiction film cover. Yeah, well, that was the the idea. I mean, people sort of said, well, it looks a bit like Firestarter, and it looks a bit like uh, the Linda Blair, a young Linda Blair. Well... It's sort of ironic. Glenn, at the time that Linda Blair was doing Exorcist 2, Glenn was going out with Linda Blair. Yeah. And he saw it, and he thought it was like a spot-on for a young Linda Blair. Yeah. But it, it, it's all part, as I say, of, of the packaging. It was to make people sort of look at it. And it's funny. I, I mean, people from... I, I mean, my daughter is, is seven. I mean, she was really miffed that she, she didn't get the job for doing the cover. Yeah. Uh, but it tends to be people from sort of young to old, they're all intrigued with the cover and they all see. And a lot of people look at the cover and they never actually, if you look, and look for the reflection in her eyes of the symbols, and there's yeah. two symbols in their eyes. Because the thing is, once again, you were talking before about the mystery element of it. Mm. I mean, that's probably another good selling point as well for the album, because people are saying, well, you know, what's it for? What does it mean? You know, it mm. gets that intrigue going, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, think, I think anything that is more than just playing a record has got to be a move in the right direction. At least, if it gets you thinking about anything it, it, it's it's entertaining yeah on that note let's play another track from the album this is called still the night that's another track from the excellent album phenomena and that's called still the night Tom, we were talking before about the uh, the actual concept idea. Now, nobody's actually done a concept album for as long as I can remember. Weren't you a little bit wary in the first place that it was actually going to take off for you? Um, I think I'd be a fool if I said no. Uh, I think at, at the time, that was probably a reason for doing it. It, it tended to be that it hadn't been done for as you say, a certain length of time. And see, that the problem I had as well, Paul, was not being an artist or a musician as such. Yeah. You have to have a vehicle for y your ideas. So the only logical way was to go down, with inverted brackets, the, the concept album situation because as soon as people say oh it's a concept album you tend to think well it's going to be self-indulgent and I didn't want that the idea was to put 
eight, nine, ten tracks together that individually were hopefully commercial, but at the same time they were part of a, an overall story. So, you know, obviously, but I think you're in, the enthusiasm you sort of work yourself up to uh, sort of counters any sort of thoughts, negative thoughts. Because like we said, I mean, nothing like this has been done for ages, but n now it's been done, it's, it's different again, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's, gosh, a concept album, that's new. You know, it's, it's, it's come round again that it is new, you know, and it hasn't really been done before. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I hope that is the, the way people look at it. Yeah. Um, it was just done the way it has been done because I couldn't do it any other way. Um, it, it isn't sort of, or it wasn't at the time we actually did it, a group. It was a group of musicians who got together to do the album. Yeah. Uh, but at that point in time, it, it wasn't a group that you could sort of uh, tour around the country. So they, as a band, could could promote it. You know, so it had to go out as a concept. How did you actually go about uh, approaching record companies? Because I mean, obviously, record companies nowadays they want the uh, the things up front and say, well, look, is it going to sell? You know, how did you actually go about convincing record companies that something like this was going to work again? Um, I saw the T boy at CBS. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I saw. No, no, I did actually. I I I didn't get past the T boy. <laughs> Uh, and I, I went to RCA and they played me some disco mixes and sort of told me this was the thing. And then they said it was going to cost them a lot of money. They understood it was going to cost them a lot of money. So if I went out and got a video deal, they were interested in the album. Yeah. And it tended to be it being a concept album was a problem and n I should be a liar if I said everybody jumped at it first time round. Um, I went to I think it was Polydor Video because I had got a video storyline they were interested in doing the video so they then put it over to Polydor Records, I won't mention the gentleman's name, but it remained there for two months uh, without a decision either to jump in the canal or get run over. Yeah. Um, so I then proceeded to carry on. At one point, uh, I was offered a deal that came from Japan, of all places. And I, I was going with that deal. And then all of a sudden, uh, I met a guy called Pete Winkleman, who was at Arista at that time. And he was very interested in it, as were Arista. And it just happens that Pete left Arista and went to Braun. And uh, the reason why it went to Braun was, if you've ever met Pete, he's so enthusiastic about things he commits to, you tend to sort of really get absorbed in his enthusiasm. Because Bronze have definitely put 150% into it, haven't they? I mean, like, looking at the album, I mean, there's a, uh, a booklet with it which sort of gives you the storyline and also the artwork we were talking about before mm. as well. I mean, that's all involved with it, free posters, etc. And you were talking before as well about the uh, the video or even a full-length feature film version being done. You know, what's happening about that? When can we expect to see something on the screen, as it were? Um, right, there, there is going to be a single video, it won't be for Dance with the Devil because as you probably realise when you get a staggered release worldwide yeah. uh, Europe and the UK have both gone basically within this week or two of each other 
on the album and the single. But in America, it's a different single. Uh, and it's just been taken by Atlantic for America. So there is th there's going to be a new video for the new single yeah. that's coming out. Uh, and the the full length um, video for the album hopefully will be towards the end of the year. I mean, the problem is to do justice to the video, you're talking a lot of money. Yeah. And you can understand um, film companies will not commit until they say exactly which way the album's going. Yeah. So, I mean, they've already budgeted the long-form video at a quarter, three quarters of a million. Flipping it. So, <laughs> you know, not yeah. everybody is going sort of charging round, waving the checks in the air. Yeah. So, it's, it tends to be like, let's do, let's get the, the album. So, it really relies on that, on, on the strength of the album, how well that actually does. Uh, in the shops, I mean, obviously it's only been released this last yes. week. Yeah. So I mean, if the, if the the sales of the album sort of rocket straight away, mm. there's a big chance that we could see that. Yeah. Very I, soon. I, yes, I, I think it, it it's any product. Um, it, it, it they have you know you've got to say it's like the Michael Jackson situation. Um, Thriller was conceived out of the album, and obviously the Thriller video. Uh, boosted the album, but the album was already a big record yeah. before the the actual video was done. Exactly, if they'd done the video first and then the album, it probably would have sort of full flat, really, wouldn't it? Uh, Not so much. Obviously, no, would have been somebody yeah, like Michael Jackson. Yes, that's gonna, yeah. yeah, I think anybody other than Michael Jackson. I think if it had have been a new artist, um, because the industry can be pretty rough on, on people at times if they just take a dislike to whether the people take a dislike that's a different but you know the media can murder yeah anybody but uh we shall have to see wait and see talking about the musicians you've used on the album again like your your brother mel and uh glenn hughes etc is there any chance of uh the phenomena project actually going out on the road at any time um if you'd have asked me that last time we met i would have said no <laughs> <laughs> so what's happened then in, four, in the last four weeks as well? Well, in the last four weeks, Glenn has left Gary Moore. So that that at the time was quite a large obstacle because yeah. obviously Glenn had commitments to the Gary Moore tour, which went, I think, straight up to Christmas. So now he's left, he... I spoke to him last night, he's fully committed uh, if a tour is put together uh, to go out on the road. Uh, there have been inquiries from Germany and America. I, I think there is more than a possibility of the the band touring. Would you be using the same musicians on the road as you have done on the album? Uh, I think so, yes. Uh, the only person maybe as uh, due to commitments would be Cozy, because as you know he's with ELP yeah. now, and he has got, I would think, a very tight timetable. But um, Ted McKenna also played on the album, yeah. and he's uh, another possibility. So who knows, we could see it on the road before very long. Uh, hopefully. Let's play another track from the album. I must admit, after playing the album all weekend, this is one of my favourite tracks. And it opens side two of the album phenomenon. This is called Believe. I must say, Tom, the production on that album is absolutely amazing. I mean, it just rings through these headphones in stereo. You actually produced the album yourself, didn't you? Yes, I did with the, the help of a guy called John Jacobs. Um, why I brought John in to sort of mix was... Uh, originally, we had a, a great engineer who engineered most of the recording 
called Paul Rovins. Paul then went to work at another studio in London and he was basically blocked out as far as recording. I think he was working on Manfred Mann's yeah. album. And we went into air to record Still the Night and that was the first time I, I'd met John who'd worked with Paul McCartney and Phil Collins and people like that and we got we got on well and I thought at that point it was the album needed another viewpoint it was the you know it was very powerful it was always powerful in the recording and we we were looking at more than a straightforward rock album yeah we were hoping that it would appeal to a larger cross-section than just straightforward rock market. So uh, I think John helped a lot as far as that angle, broadening the viewpoint. Yeah. And obviously he had a lot to do with the production as well, you know. Because as you say, it's not just a heads down rock and roll album. It does, like, say, tell a story. And I mean, Glenn's vocal range on it is absolutely amazing, isn't it? You know, I mean, it just it stands out a mile. It's so clear. Yeah, Glenn is. He's been maligned by a lot of people, but one thing you can't malign him for is his vocal. He, the sort of person he, he is when he's rolling, and he's on form in the studio. We. It may not seem a lot, but he did three vocals in sort of a six or eight hour session. Three complete vocals. Yeah. And not only does he sing you the, the song one way, he'll sing it you three different ways. And it was quite funny. During the recording of it, he didn't know whether he was out of contract as far as his recording was concerned with other people yeah so he decided one day he wasn't going to be Glenn Hughes he was going to be somebody else and he he then he set about disguising his voice because <laughs> <laughs> there's so many people that have tried to imitate him over the years you know and I don't think anybody's matched it at all you know I mean you get so many rock albums that uh Try to sound like Glenn Hughes sounds, but just to me, nobody's matched it at all. No, I got, mean, this is just the icing on the cake, really. He's got a... I think the difference between Glenn and most other people, Glenn can pull it out from down, deep down. He's got a great bottom end, and he can also hit the top, but he can also do it within the space of a line in a song. Yeah. You know, he doesn't have to think about it. He can sort of, he can really draw it from the pit of his stomach, you know. And then he can hit the falsettos. He's, he's quite an amazing vocalist. And he's, he does it live, you know, that he, he does it live. He doesn't need to do a million and one takes. Yeah. He's, you know... He's a great vocalist, that's all you can really say about The best. Uh, going back to the vocals, on the very last track, uh, the track Phenomena, which uh, closes the album, you've used the Midlands Boys Choir. Was there any particular reason for that? Um, the Midlands Boys Choir. Yes. <laughs> Paul Robbins was originally in the Midlands Boys Choir, um, and we were talking one day about... Uh, we, would, uh, we were talking about Believe, and I said I didn't want to do a normal middle eight in Believe. And we, we were talking, and I said I wanted to do, to do a track that we didn't use any instrumentation, we just used vocals. And he suggested this middle and voice choir. Well, I wrote all the words that I wanted them to sing in English and they were translated into Latin which is funny now because I can't find <laughs> <laughs> what I wrote in English down and like the the music company keeps ringing me up and saying exactly what are they singing yeah <laughs> you know and you say well I don't know <laughs> but what happened one Sunday 
they turned up on a four to seat coach I think there were 15 boys ranging from 9 to 11, 12 and about 15, 20 men and we did them separately the recording we did I think we did the boys as a block first and yeah. then the men well while we were recording the male section the the boys like went into the was the kitchen but it was the amusement room as well and they came for the first 10 minutes they they came running in wanting 10 peas for the pool table <laughs> and the there was a a space invader in there and after 10 minutes they stopped ca coming in so i thought well i wonder what the problem is because there's 15 of them in there you know and they tucked into sandwiches and and pop and that and I went in and they'd taken the top off the pool table oh, no. <laughs> and they got into the space invader and they were mentally just knocking the switches and getting free games out of it but uh, no they they were really good and what is nice the lad who does the solo on believe his voice is broken now yeah so just got it at the right time yeah I must say, I mean, say, I've listened to the album several times, and to me, the final track, with it being sort of uh, a choir, tends to pull the whole album together, you know, the whole meaning of the story. Mm. It just finishes it off nicely, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, think, I think a lot of music is about feel. You don't really have to totally understand what it's all about, uh, as long as it's... It feels right. It's like if you hear a song on a radio and you you can't quite hear what it's all about, but you're intrigued by yeah. it because it triggers something off. And I think the Phenomena track itself just felt right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that that's what it was all about. It just felt as it, it was the right thing to have. Great. Well, I hope everything goes all right for you anyway. I mean, I'm totally overwhelmed with the album, and I'm sure people that have been listening to it tonight are as well. Best of luck with the album. Look forward to seeing the video and uh, all the things that you've got planned for us, and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. It's Thank been great. You. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much indeed. Going to play out now with a track, uh, once again, from the Phenomena album. As I say, it's out in the shops on Bronze Records, and if you don't buy this, there must be something wrong with you, believe me. This is a track called Who's Watching You. Once again, thanks to Tom for joining us tonight. And right after this, I'm going to be sending a competition where you could win two signed copies of the Phenomena album, so stick around for that.